start from 17 once again. This is the long forgotten Darksiders 2 apocalyptic difficulty video walkthrough. And uh, this is the resumation of that walkthrough. So, you know, when the game first came out, I started making this guide. It didn't get all that great a reception. It's not exactly all that difficult. And it was a, a lot of effort at the time when other projects definitely needed my attention. But I've gone back and cleared it up now that, you know, the, the rush period is down with all the, the AAA titles covered. And this is the Tree of Life and the Lord of Bones. So now that we've killed the Guardian, we're going to be moving forward into the next section of the game. And uh, this involves going to a completely new world, which is quite interesting, uh, even though it's not my favourite world, because, you know, it, it kind of all looks the same, and extremely puzzle-heavy. But that's okay, because Darksiders 2 is, is an interesting game in that respect. It, it uses the mantra of the, you know, the more dungeons, the better which uh, is not a mantra I personally share, but it does do them quite well, so I can't complain. Uh, the puzzles, uh, although they do reuse a lot of assets and a lot of elements that they introduce earlier, they're still pretty fun, still pretty interesting, and it did take me a while to get back in the swing of this game, because it had been a while since I played it, and I do think the one thing that, that lets this game down, aside from it, the, the hype that there was going to be you know, tons of NPCs to talk to, towns, quests, you know, a real sense of a kind of culture which, you know, ultimately turned out to about seven dudes you can talk to and they all give you fucking fetch quests, uh, is the combat. And don't get me wrong, the combat in the game, if you're playing through and, you know, you're not on apocalyptic, you can pretty much press whatever you want and get the job done and have a lot of fun because it looks quite flashy, but when you get into the, the more subtleties of, of staying alive on the harder difficulties, and, you know, that's where the game really falls apart. Because the, the more you try to, to use moves and strategies and techniques and get fancy with the game's combat, uh, the more you get your ass kicked. And I often found that the more I mashed and didn't care for moves, just kind of spazzed, the better I did. And to me, that is the sign of a bad combat system. Because the combat in this game... Uh, looks deceptively deep at first because there are modifiers, there are different ways to do things, there are you know a whole host of secondary weapons and categoristics which are, are quite good but they're they're all so extremely limited and you know once you really get deep down and, and dirty into the the design floor of it, it's just a poor man's god of war. But the difference is is God of War realized at times it threw a clusterfuck of enemies at you so it was courteous enough to give you a block. This game gives you a dodge, which you can do three times in rapid succession before death decides to have a breather, and the dodge itself does not give you enough iframes to make it all that fucking useful. Combine that with the fact that there is a countering feature of the game, which is about as precise as the Royal Guard uh, from A Devil May Cry, in a game that is, you know, completely and utterly unresponsive at times when it comes to the, the you know, the, the full meta side of, of really getting obsessive over combat mechanics. And if you play a game like Metal Gear Rising Revengeance, or any of the Devil May Cries, and then you come back to this game, it feels extremely lacking in responsiveness. And once again, these are only knocks towards an extremely, you know, almost anally retentive aspect of combat. To a lot of people, they'll probably think it's perfectly fine, but to me, it just feels poor. And especially when you try to play it at a higher level, uh, not saying that you know not everybody tries to do that it just it just really comes comes down to this it's spammy it's really fucking spammy and it shouldn't be and it's spammy because they they don't throw intelligent patterns of, of enemies at you they throw ridiculous amounts of enemies at you where you can't evade them all so it just gets into this you know try and stun them all as opposed to evading because that's the only real solid strategy that you have and I'm not a fan of that. I'm not a fan of here's 60 dudes in a room, just mash your way through them unless they'll gangbang you. And I do think the combat really shines when you're only up against, you know, two or three enemies, or, or one or two big enemies, or just one enemy. The combat then can, can be really fun and really interesting, but when they put you in a room with a million dudes, like, there are a couple of really good moves for crowd control, but you can't hit everything and somebody interrupts you and it takes you a while to get recovered and the stun locking, the enemies can stun lock you when you can't cancel out of it. 
it sounds like a lot of jargon, but you know, suffice it to say, folks, I didn't enjoy the combat of this game. I didn't enjoy the, the you know, the the dungeon to dungeon to dungeon with very little else in between of any kind of interest, at all at all in this game, and it's such a shame because this could have been a fantastic game. It really could have, and it is still a good game. Uh, do not let me put you off checking it out because it's a solid good game. It's just it could have been a, a, a really special game, and I think their ambition to make such a, a large project uh, meant that a lot of the finer details suffered because of it. Uh, another thing you're going to notice as well in these videos is occasionally some videos will be longer than others. Uh, that generally means that it's quite a long dungeon, and I didn't want to split it up too much, or or things of that nature. Also, you're going to notice quite a lot of, of crossfades. Uh, the reason for this is literally because I couldn't remember some of the game when I came back to it, so it took me, you know, maybe five to ten minutes to figure out the puzzle that I should have already known, and instead of showing you uh, myself struggling or forgetting where I'm going, I wanted to, to, to trim that stuff out so that the guide was as cohesive as possible and, you know, help the most amount of people. But... I do also appreciate that this guide is probably not going to be something people watch for difficulty because the game, uh, when it's not being unfair, is is very simple. Uh, some of the puzzles can be a little bit of a brain teaser, but at the same time, uh, I, I really believe that you're playing this game for the puzzles more than anything else because it's the thing that is probably the most enjoyable that it does. Because it does tax you, but at the same time, it's not offensive. And it's the only part of the game aside from, you know, just repeti rep repetition, sorry, that I can't flaw. And that and the voice acting, I really like the voice acting. I think there's there's a lot of really profound, you know, uh, dialogue in the game, which taken out of context would sound extremely ridiculous and hyperbolic, but, uh, you know, when playing playing the game and, you know, the fate of the world is online and all that kind of stuff, it's it really fits, and I like that. And the art style, the art style's fantastic, the visuals are quite good, uh, the frame rate and the performance is is not great at times especially but you know you can live with that oh and something to bear in mind here do not fight these bugs like i'm fighting them just bash b and grab the grab the tits off them like god of war because it's the safest way to do it uh, the only problem with this game is the detection on b is, is is really bad so there's times when you'll be running around an enemy physically touching it and the game just doesn't realize that you're putting the input it wants and uh, it takes him a while to do it for some reason so just bear that in Another thing to, to mention too, I don't know if I mentioned earlier in the walkthrough, but the best way to play this game to have the easiest time is to get lucky with the loot and get a possessed weapon rather soon, preferably your scythes, and then feed it upgrades so that you can upgrade critical chance, critical damage, and health on critical. Uh, you can also do other things like, you know, wrath on crit, or uh, execution chance, and then health on execution, but essentially what you want is you want the ability for your attacks to heal you. And that is what makes you powerful. And if you can combine a, a good possessed weapon that gets your health on critical with a side weapon that does the same, you will be unkillable at times. And I'm going to be using the unstoppable ability, because when you fully upgrade it, not only does it make you really strong, but it's almost guaranteed critical, so it's extremely easy to, to get your life back and do de and deal massive damage while not having to, to mess around with the, the nuance of the combat, which is severely lacking in my opinion. Another thing to bear in mind too is if you can put uh, Wrath on critical, you can also facilitate an endless, you know, casting of Unstoppable. So, uh, you know, on a good fight, you will be doing maximum damage, constantly healing yourself, constantly getting Wrath back to do to do maximum damage, and and have a really easy time with the combat. And uh, you're going to beat a boss later on in the game that gives you a weapon that is the perfect side weapon to a good possessed scythe that, that heals you. And you can literally just mash the button and damage race enemies because they can't physically kill you. Uh, but that right there, when I dropped into this room for some reason, there was a ton of enemies to kill. Uh, when, I, when I reloaded the checkpoint after dying because I got brutalized by them, there was only like two skeletons and I couldn't understand why there was a massive gang of them when I first dropped in. So, interesting little checkpointing there. Well, that's, that's pretty much as simple as it is. But going back to the possessed weapon thing, it's really ironic that I'm telling everybody to use the strategy that I did on my first playthrough because it made the game really easy. 
on this playthrough, I never find a possessed scythe. I just don't get one. And I found that quite funny, actually, because I get possessed secondary weapons, but none of them are of a high enough level that they're useful, even when I upgrade them. And it definitely makes the game a little bit more challenging, but at the same time, uh, this is one of those games where I think it wants you to do the side quests in between dungeons to level uh, death up. Because the amount of times that I've gone directly to the next dungeon and the level jump in the enemies has been pretty high and, you know, resulted in me getting my ass handed to me a couple of times until I fought a lot better. It happened a lot and happened more than on my first playthrough, so I'm not entirely sure how the enemies scale uh, when it comes to moving through dungeons, but if you notice an enemy is two levels higher than you, chances are it's going to do some serious damage and it's going to be really dangerous. The, the lucky thing is, though, the only real enemies that are dangerous are anything in a pack of about 20, because you can just get stun-locked and it's really cheesy. Uh, and the the women with the big tits and the, the two scythe arms from the first Darksiders, which were the hardest things on Darksiders 1, they're back, and if they're ever in numbers of, like, 2 to 3, that is a fight you're going to remember, because it's generally not a very fun fight. Um... Any of the heavies, when you come up against a group of the big guys that just eat your attacks, you don't seem to be able to interrupt them, and they just knock you on your ass. And then the the, the shield electricity guy, who, for the life of me, when I, I continued recording this guide, I couldn't figure out a good way of killing him. He just seemed to take the piss, and I found it really strange. And what I've done here is, there is a lot of exploring on the game, there is a lot of times I neglect to do that exploring, but every so often I will... I will actively attempt to get a chest or to do something a little differently and I wanted to keep it in. It is going to make some of the videos longer than they need to be, but at the same time, for anybody that does enjoy Darksiders, it gives them quite a lot of content to watch because there are 49 videos in this guide. Uh, this is video 21. So I recorded the first 20 videos when the game came out and then the, across the last two days I recorded 50 gigs worth of the game. and. Like my, my feelings are the same as when I first played it, and there's a podcast that I haven't released yet because I've been trying to, to get us to record some more so I can I can give it to you when we have others leading from it, but at the moment we don't, so I'm, I'm not releasing it, but it's only with me and Aiden, and I share a lot of my frustrations about this game on that podcast because it's really fresh, I was recording the guide at the time, and I wasn't enjoying it. And usually, if I'm not enjoying a game, I just power through it and finish it and then never go back. But on this game, I decided to take a break, and I think it, it definitely helped. My knowledge of the combat, my knowledge of some of the strategies was lacking because I couldn't remember what I did the first time, so I just kind of had to figure it out again. But at the same time, I had a lot more fun than I did forcing myself to play it. And this is actually the first guide I've stopped out of all the ones I've done since I started. And uh, we're coming up on two years on, on, on YouTube now, which is a pretty important milestone. But this was the first guide I ever stopped. There is another one that I haven't necessarily stopped, but I haven't uploaded, which is my Portal 2 co-op guide, which I still have the files for. It's just the videos are so big that they take ages to upload, and it's one of those things where I keep forgetting to bring it, because I do have it, I have it completed. It's the only guide I've ever done with a subscriber and I feel terrible that I still haven't uploaded it because he you know he, he committed a lot of his time for it and I do want him to get some recognition it's just one of those projects that just got lost by the wayside even though it is completed it's just waiting to be uploaded and I have absolutely no excuse other than laziness and bad internet but yeah aside from that and the, the Saints Row, which has stopped at this moment in time, but this, I believe, was before Saints Row. They're the only ones that I've ever stopped on. And it is a mistake. It's definitely a mistake. Like, when I go back to Saints Row, it's probably going to be funny, because I'm not going to know what the fuck I'm doing, and sometimes that is funnier, but... It's probably not going to be as smooth, and speaking as not as smooth... We have a filter in our fridge for water. And when I do these commentaries, especially the longer ones, especially this this type of stuff, uh, I get I drink a lot of water from this filter. Because I've, I've currently got a pint glass next to me that's filled. And I can go through maybe five or six of those when I do a couple of hour session. And my throat's still, you know, just completely dry and useless. 
because as as you know, I don't like awkward silences on my video, so I force myself to to talk over the entire thing, and it's kind of become, you know, one of my calling cards as a, as a YouTube content creator. And some people hate it, some people love it. It's you know, it's a mixed batch, and the the filter that we use was like this Brita filter tank that you filled up. Don't get me wrong, guys. I, I have the most exciting tangents on YouTube. Just just stay with me here. It, it gets really good. It doesn't. But uh, <laughs> I fill this thing up before I start, and it gives me quite delicious water. I'm not the biggest fan of water. I personally find it quite boring, but it turns out your body needs it. Your body kind of likes it. So, you know, it's one of those business relationships. It's a necessary evil. And we're actually changing fridges, and the, the filter doesn't fit in the new one, which is preposterous. So it's been thrown away, so I'm now on just tap water, and the difference is ridiculous. I, I literally f feel like I'm I'm a horse in one of those cages, you know, that they, they drive them around in, where they just look like a sleigh, they look like something out of Gladiator, minus all the, you know, the ridiculous kilts and gladiuses and fighting and shouting and Russell Crowe and everything. And I'm used to, you know, staying in the Ritz with this awesomely filtered water. And I'm feeling it, guys, I really am. I'm asking for sympathy right now, just like children in need. You know, I don't take revenue from every phone call and donation. But yeah, God, normal water sucks. And I don't even live in, like, Africa where the pipes are shit, or, or Spain. Because that's one of the really interesting things about this world. When you go to different parts of it and their, you know, infrastructure of pipage that, that delivers water is of a different quality to, to some countries and thus there is more minerals and more builds up of different things, more bacteria, you know, different sanitization and essentially all it means is if you drink their water you get the shits and it's, it's because you're used to, you know, essentially posher water or cleaner water and if you live there you have no idea where anyone's on about because your body's, you know, completely used to it, your immune system's been sampling it for decades, it's now you know, like Sylvester Stallone just sitting there chilling out in Cobra with a toothpick but that is the end of my extremely boring water topic as we climb onto this area, which is a, a floating sky fortress that's got these crazy snake things, and this is one of the coolest environments in the game and it's also one of the shorter areas which I like, and I wish there was more of this you know, just short little snippets of traversal, and then maybe some exposition, some storyline, some questing, and... I don't know, it just... To me, it could have been better in... And I don't know if it's the response from the game, or what, what's really happened, but... Uh, Maduera, I forget his name... Uh, the dude who's essentially the artist that came up with all the designs, that was the creative director at Vigil, making Darksiders, has left the company to, I assume, finish that comic he started... Uh, a million years ago, which is something that I wish a certain Korean artist would do on a comic or a, a manhwa known as Priest, you lazy bastard, finish the story. And I wonder if it's because he didn't have enough creative control or if the game didn't turn out the way he wanted, because if I was a creative director for this game, it would have been a different game. I can guarantee you that, because the combat would have been so refined, the enemy placements would have been a lot different, and just the pacing of the game and and the ending the ending would have been different cuz i don't want to spoil anything for anybody else but dark siders 1 had one of the best endings in gaming because it was that you know that universal moment of freddie mercury with his fist in the air where everybody kind of went fuck yes and what did this game do tell a different story instead of continuing the awesome moment at the end of the first game and you know the only real logic behind that decision has to be oh let's make money make a series and proliferate let's annualize and make tons of games and you know dollar signs in his eyes and you know suck the corporate cock and all that great business when in effect this could be the last Darksiders especially since the creative directors left so the one that they bring out you know the preceding year is probably going to be a much different game because creative directors are a big thing just look at Resident Evil, just look at Devil May Cry. You lose your creative director, you get Devil May Cry 2, you get Resident Evil 6. It's just madness what can happen when the, the head or the helm of the, the, the creative process is not somebody who, you know, gives his blood to get a good game or get a game that feels like it should feel. And I know that there are hundreds of other people that go towards making a great game that get overlooked. It's much like the actors and the directors, how they take all the 
you know, all the rewards and then all the people that made it possible are generally, you know, the unsung heroes, but I'm telling you, game design, I, I need to be a part of it, I really do. But thanks for watching, guys, and I will see you on the next video. You take care now.